I think one of the things as IT professionals we can do a better job of, including me, is telling stories. Because stories are what drive people's engagement and drives them forward. So I'm super excited this morning to hear what our next presenter has to say about storytelling and the stories that he's going to tell. So join me in giving a warm welcome to Lewis Richardson, who's the chief storyteller for Synity. Synity. I did finally got that right. Thank you, my friend. Sounds on. Are we good? Are we hot here? If not, I'll just speak very loudly. Uh, is it okay if I stand down here rather than up there? Is that okay? Is the lighting all good? Okay. So first of all, as a storyteller, I learned to listen for stories. I'm looking forward to hearing some great stories over the, the course. But as I was sitting at this table, I just have to tell you this. I was sitting at this table preparing, and the table behind, raise your hand, proud table, right? I hear, these are the words I hear. And then the police showed up. <laughs> now, doesn't that kind of make you go, what? What is going on at that table? But I was wondering what kind of crowd we had here. Um, and uh, I found out it had nothing to do with you guys. What I, what I think is, uh, is important when we tell our stories is that we make sure, and this is actually a, a lesson to learn anytime you give a presentation, is you want to make sure that you have the right message at the right time to the right people. And as being kind of new to this audience, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this. And there's, this, there's this, this guy that's a bagpipe player. He plays bagpipes. And as often is called upon to, to, do, to go to funerals, to do funerals, play bagpipes at funerals. And a, and a pastor came to him and said, would you mind coming and playing with this homeless guy we've been dealing with? He has no family. He has no friends. But he asked for music to be played at, at his internment. Would you mind coming and playing? And this guy said, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to. And it happened to be the next day. And so he struck off that next morning to go do this. But he forgot the fact that this guy actually was going to be, be buried in a place that was like in the North Georgia mountains. And he had no idea how to get there. And so he's wandering around trying to find this place. And he realizes he's hopelessly lost. And by the time he arrives, the, 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 the funeral hearse is gone, the pastor is gone. I mean, all that's left is, you know, you see the grave site, and there's a mound of dirt, and then there's a tree with some guys, you know, sitting underneath it with shovels. They're having lunch, and he thinks, I have just messed this up. I've completely missed this. So kind of frustrated, he pulls his bagpipes out of the case. You know, he's got a case. He pulls them out, and he walks up to the grave site. And as he looks down, you know, it's, it, the vault has already been covered. You know, they've got the concrete, you know, the cement top on it. And he's looking at it going, I just messed up. Time, time was bad. And so he thought, well, you know, I'm here. Let me do what I'm supposed to do. I'll give the message. So he basically pulled his bagpipes out and started playing. And interestingly enough, as he played, the guys around the tree decided, well, they, they came over. They wandered over and stood next to him and solemnly as he played. And, and, they, and his last you know, tune was Amazing Grace. And even there were a few tears in the eyes, you know, these guys as they were standing there with him. And then he finished, and he kind of sighed, put his bagpipes back in the case, zipped it up, and walked back to his car. And as he's walking back to his car, he's thinking, you know, it may have been the wrong timing, but at least it was the right message, right? And as he was getting to his car door, the guys were going back to having lunch. One of the guys said to the other, he said, that's the darndest thing I have ever seen. And I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. The point being is I don't want any of you to leave this after my talk and go, that's the darndest thing I have ever seen, because I, it's also to have to be the right audience. And so with the audience that's here, the best way for me to kind of get to know you was to look at the survey. I don't know how many of you participated in the survey or were a part of it, but it gave me a sense of what, what are you interested in, especially at this time of, uh, of what you're doing and what are the highlights of what you're doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes and explore things around learning and knowledge and how that actually attracts and how that actually connects to business outcomes. To introduce this, I'm going to start with this guy, Stephen Johnson. He has a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. He has a great TED Talk. It's a few years old now. But it's a wonderful piece of work because he talks about chance favoring the connected mind. The fact if you get in a position where you can actually connect ideas together, by the way, this is a great space to do that, it was, as Jeff said earlier, you could actually come up with some brilliant things. And in his talk, I'm going to steal some work from his talk, but in his talk he talks about how in England at one time during the Age of Enlightenment, there was all these ideas rushing about, and he began looking at what, what that may have caused that. And prior to that time in England... Um, because the water was not really good, a, a, a British person would wake up in the morning and they'd have a little beer with their breakfast, and then at lunchtime they'd have some wine, 
In the afternoon, maybe a spot of gin, and at night for dinner, they'd have some wine and beer. Basically, they spent the entire day kind of drunk, okay, under the influence of alcohol. Now, some of you probably can relate to that, but this is, this is the situation they were in. But when coffee houses and tea houses became introduced, they actually had these spaces where instead of using these, these, these depressants, they were using stimulants. And you can imagine the difference of spending your day in, in a stimulated environment and then the space of coffee houses brought together people of all different types of trades and boundaries, and they began to share ideas. And he believes that that was one of the reasons why the Age of Enlightenment actually happened. It was, it was spurred on by these spaces and by this, this, this environment that was created. I believe that innovation happens more rapidly where there's collaboration and open exchange of ideas. I think when we look at some of the survey results, we can tell that that needs to happen inside of organizations. We need to be able to collaborate maybe broader um, can anybody help me with this? October 4th, 1957. Any historians in the room that know what happens on that day? It was a Friday, just in case you're curious. Anyone? Come on, speak up. Sputnik. Sputnik, absolutely. The, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, okay? And it was all the rage, okay? It was a, it was a, it, people were just concerned about this thing now flying around the Earth. And there were some, a couple of guys at the advanced physics lab at John Hopkins who, by the way, it was like a geek fest. This thing's flying, we're gonna listen to stuff, we can, it's this amazing piece of work. And these guys got together and said, you know what, this thing is emitting a signal. The uh, Soviets actually put a signal in it that we could listen to because they wanted us to know it's not a hoax. It's really up there, you can listen to it. And so these guys with these microwave receivers and so forth said, you know what, I bet we could listen to this. And they began listening to it, and they all gathered in this guy's office, and they began listening to this thing and recording things, and they realized, you know, this thing, the Doppler effect, I think we could, I think we could check its speed and where it's going. And so they began coming up with this idea that with different listening devices, these different fixed locations on Earth, they could find this random space, this random thing in space. And it wasn't their main job, but it was something that all these guys kind of got together to do. And eventually, a manager got involved, which is sometimes the death of things, but sometimes the manager got involved, and he said, I hear that you're in this project, and you got these two fixed places on Earth, and you pick this random spot. If you had something fixed in the, in, the, in the sky, could you actually find a random place on Earth? And they said, well, we figured the math out, and they pulled out a little big, gigantic univac, and they ran the numbers. They said, yeah, we can do that. He was working on a system because he said, we got a bunch of these nuclear submarines floating around inside the, the Pacific, and we want to make sure that when we launch that missile, it's going to land right on Moscow. So we kind of got to know where the submarine is. So he, that was the problem he was trying to solve. And today it's in your pockets, okay? It's in your GPS. That's where the birth of the GPS came from, is this, this, this act of people talking together, understanding things, and, and grouping together. So you have to be able to create these spaces. And by the way, this isn't just about rocket science. This is about you and what you do every day. This is about making Johnsonville brats. This is about the things that you do and, and the innovation that happens. You need to be able to create these spaces. Because everyone has, as Linda Hill talks in her talk, everyone has slices of genius, okay? There, there are people who know certain things. They may not know everything, but they know certain things about certain things. And if you're listening for that, and you, and you understand that, and you collect that, then corporate-wise, your, your, your enterprise information management system is actually increased by the, by the corporate knowledge that you gather. Okay, so you have, by the way, and you are responsible for helping this happen. When I think about where data plays in this, I consider data as being knowledge at rest. Think about it. If data's sitting in a database somewhere, no one's querying it, it's not moving, it's, nothing's happening to it, it basically has a potential knowledge. There's, there's something there, but it's at rest. It has like potential energy, okay? Any of you physics people? Potential energy, it was sitting at rest. But when that stuff starts moving, things start happening. And I believe knowledge happens when people and the data starts moving about. When those intersections happen, when people interact with data, they interact with systems, they create new stuff. There, there's a couple of reasons why data moves around, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea is this intersection of people and, move, and data moving about. When I go to the study, here's the question that was asked, you guys. What's the biggest barrier or challenge you and or your company face regarding EIM processes? And Jeff entered the, uh, talked about this just in the entry, but the opening, but it's the connectivity. How do I cross that barrier? How do I get my systems to talk to each other? How do I get people to talk to each other? How do I get people to talk to systems? This idea of how do I have this open exchange where we actually, instead of, instead of in fact, let me ask you a question, because this was interesting. When he mentioned the fact, uh, actually, I guess Ron, I guess, mentioned the fact that he thought those numbers were upside down. You know, the IT was 60 and business was whatever it was, six or nine or whatever. When he said he, wanted, he thought it should be flipped, I want you to know, I heard people go, mm. 
I mean, do we believe that? I mean, what, what is it we believe? We're, who owns the data? In fact, if, if the ownership is not figured out, if we don't know who owns the data, if we're not who's responsible for it, who's responsible for governance, that's one of those things where you people need to get together. I say you people, like I'm not one of you. It's like we need to get together and we need to understand with our, with our business uh, practitioners, partners, and with others, you know, let's, let's talk about this. Let's not come into the fact that we actually build a system exactly what you asked for it to do and it won't let me pull in SAP finance data when I'm done. Okay, open exchange of ideas. The best thing to ha when that happens though is to capture the data, or excuse me, capture the knowledge when it's happening. Every day, and this is something that we, we feel strongly about at Senity, every day knowledge is lost because it's not captured. Okay, I was talking to the lady from Hoffman and Mifflin. I'm sorry, your name again? Iris. What's that? Iris. Iris from Hoffman and Mifflin. By the way, are you, are you actually presenting later? Awesome, go to her session, she's marvelous. Okay, and I've only known her for five minutes. The, the point is, at we, at when we learn things, especially in school, you know, I told her I read some of her books because I was forced to read some of them in school. But the idea is when we learn stuff, how many of you actually took a, a language class? Spanish, French, whatever in class, right? How many of you could speak fluently in those languages? Uh, right? Most of us not. Why? Because there's a gentleman back there. He's proud. He knows all the languages. It's great. The point is most of us learn things in order to do something. We're going to pass a test. Right? How many of us learn things, especially as a naive teenager, because we think we're actually going to use Spanish one day or use algebra one day or whatever. We just learn it to pass the test. If you think about a lot of our data projects and a lot of stuff we do, we do them so we get them done. And then we move on. And we at Senity actually believe that's a bit of a waste because you're learning a lot of stuff during the course of that that you should actually take advantage of. In fact, if you just look at a normal data migration project, this is a timeline of, of, of knowledge and understanding, and this is over time. If you look at most data ma migration projects, you start off and you, you learn a little bit about what's going on, and you apply it, and maybe you take some test data, and you, and you run it through the system, and then you find all this problem, the failures and stuff, and you say, okay, here's, here's some more stuff, and you kind of get better and better and better. In fact, at the table this morning, someone said, you can never, you can never fail if you keep pushing the date back. That is not a, a recipe for success, let me tell you. We have a number of companies who we've met and have said, this is our problem, we keep pushing the date back. We believe, however, that if you take advantage, and I'll tell you later about the, the, the momentum you can have when you start off, but with Ascenity Advanced Data Migration, what we do is we, over time, because we've experienced it and we've put it in software and so forth, we actually give you the advantage of, as you're learning things, you keep applying that same learning over and over and over again. Even if the people in the project move around, you can keep learning and getting better and better and better, to actually to the point to when it comes time to actually do that migration, that finish or whatever it is that you call yourself, this, this end thing, it actually becomes quite boring because you've already done it, you've learned all but as these things are done, for instance, let's say I'm acquiring a company and they have a thing called customer. And I'm a company and I have a thing called customer, but I also have a thing called a prospect, or let me call it a constituent, a constituent. A constituent is a customer who we have all their data, but they've never bought anything from us. But we still consider them a customer, but they're really a constituent. Well, I'm bringing this customer data in from this other company that I've acquired, I've got to now figure out what's the difference between a customer and a constituent. And I have to decide that. And I may go to business people and say, so tell me what it means. And they say, well, this is the reason. The reason is we have these constituents that they've never bought from us. Okay, so that's a rule. I can put that in migration. I can make sure my data gets across. Guess what? That rule, that, th that thing that you just realized, the fact the difference between a customer and a constituent, that's knowledge. And if you just let it go into the filter to migrate the data, and you don't use it later, it's a waste. Because what's going to happen? Somebody from that old company, or that company that you acquired, is sitting down at their desk years later, and they're, they're, they're filling out something, and they see the word constituent, and they go, I have no idea what constituent means. Well, guess what? You learned that one time. Why don't you tell them what that is? So what we've done is we've actually been able to take and use cloud technology and capture that knowledge and put that knowledge in a position to where you can actually apply it across your migration project so that you don't forget things. But also you can apply it even further across a broader spectrum of things. You can actually take this and apply it across all your data journeys. So what you learned about one system and one project, when you go to another one, chances are a lot of those same decisions are also applicable and you should be able to leverage them. And so using the Senity Knowledge Platform, you actually can do that. But the idea is, the whole idea is, is capture the knowledge when it happens. Don't wait for end of a project, you let's debrief and see what did we learn. Because you'll have forgotten. There's two reasons people move data, I think. Well, actually, two main reasons. There are probably lots of reasons, but I'll give you two. Necessity and curiosity. Things that we move data when we talk about necessity, 
is like transactions. I get, bring a new customer on. I need to get, get data from them. Uh, something's been sold, I need to change over. I need to move data to the supply chain. Um, Replication is a good reason why I want to move data. Now, the people are saying, well, I want to move data from, from what I have in my current systems. I'm going to go to, to like, say, a data lake, and I need to move data up to that data lake and keep it up to date while I play with it up here in this data lake. That's a reason, a necessity for using uh, uh, moving data. Mergers and acquisitions we just talked about. And systems upgrades. Systems upgrades. This is the subject we're not supposed to talk about, right? This is when I just understand that, that maybe we should talk about it. But we're going to talk about it. What's your company's current strategy concerning SAP S4 HANA? 78% of you said that you're going to be involved in or plan to be involved with SAP S4 HANA. And by the way, I looked at the hands in the room and I'd guess about three quarters of you raised your hand saying we're going to do this, do something about it. Okay. What I think is incredible was the other <coughs> question. How does your company plan to manage the migration of your data to SAP S4 HANA? 25% of you said, we think we got a handle on it. We think we, we, think we, can, we know how we're going to do this. Maybe we've got some tools. Maybe we've got some ideas. Some others are saying we're going to use some SAP technology and whatever. What I think is incredible about this slide, and maybe that's the reason his hands didn't pop up so readily, 47% of you said, I don't know, and I'm not sure. All right. I see some smiles in the audience. I guess those people can identify with that. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how we're going to do that. And this is a number I want to talk about in a minute with another number that came out of the study. Because this is the idea that you're going to move to S4 HANA. This is, a, this, is, this is part of your business. And by the way, it's all the right reasons to do it. The question is, how, are, how do you do that? And many of you are sitting there going, I'm not really sure. Curiosity is another thing that allow, causes people to move data about. And when I think about curiosity, I think of things like reports. How's our sales going? What's our inventory look like? Analytics, uh, you guys are involved with supporting analytics uh, projects and people are saying I'm, I'm trying to pull together stuff. But then maybe we're, we're looking at artificial intelligence or machine learning or natural language processing. These are areas that we want to go. This is, we're curious about what we can do if our data was in a situation where we could actually do that. And that's, that's a curiosity thing. By the way, I love necessity. Okay, necessity is great. Uh, I'm the personality that I live for curiosity. I want to know what's next. I guess it's the storyteller in me or whatever. So what else can we do? And what if, what if kind of things. That's the part of your organization that's probably very, trying to be very innovative. But yet when asked the question, what role do emerging technologies, like those above, play in your EIM process, 91% of you said they're going to do something. Uh, the 9%, by the way, at the bottom, who I'd like to talk to you guys, whoever that 9%. It, it, it's not a matter of if it's going to play, it's a matter of when. Okay, first of all, and I appreciate those who are honest enough to say, you know, it's going to do something, but I'm really not sure. We're not doing anything right now, but we're, but we're planning to use it. Okay, it's like we find it interesting, but we just haven't yet done it. Okay, I want to, I want to look at those two numbers for just a moment. Let's play around with this for a minute, if you don't mind. And I don't know how many of you identify with these numbers, and I apologize for those of you who don't. If you'll stay with me for a minute, maybe we'll learn something. But 47% that don't know how they're going to get to S4 HANA, get their data moved over, and 41% who say EIM, something's interesting, but I'm not sure and I'm not doing anything with it. What do we do with that? And I'm going to suggest, because, because a storyteller is, I guess, one of the things I've done. I've been, in, I've been a programmer and an analyst, and I've, I've done production. I've been in sales. I've been in marketing. I've, I've had the blessing of having a broad experience throughout the enterprises for you know, three, or three decades now. And one of the things I've always done is I've always looked at the people. What is this doing with people? And even the survey itself, I don't know how many of you do this, but you, you, know, you see a question in a survey and you go, why did they ask that question? You begin saying, why did they ask that question? And then you see the answer and you say, why do people answer it that way? And I looked at these two, two, two responses and my thought was, why does someone do, why, why is this? And I'm gonna suggest as much as we may not wanna talk about it, that's the reason. <coughs> Okay, we as humans have this fear instinct. We have this fear instinct of, of the unknown and things that maybe we're not sure about. And I'm going, to I'm going to explore for just a couple of minutes as we kind of close this with the fear of monsters and of mountains. Two categories, monsters. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman I have a pleasure of working with. 
uh, Jamie Kelly. He's, a, he's our UK, uh, he actually he's the marketing manager for Europe and Africa. And he was working with some of the other people at Sanity, and they were coming up with this thought of how do we make things simple? And by the way, I saw a booth out here, I don't know whose booth it is, right in the corner, but they talked about something like data, something simplified. I'm all for simplifying stuff, okay? We need to make things simpler and more understandable. And they were like, how do we tell what we do in a simple way? We've been doing it for you know, 20 plus years, and it's a really complex thing that we do, but how do we say it simply enough? And so they took a shot at kind of a, a do-it-yourself list of things that you should do, but they weren't happy, fully satisfied with that, and they, someone tossed around the idea, what if we wrote a children's book? Okay, what if we wrote a children's book about data migration? Could we do that? Could we actually write a book that a five-year-old would understand? Now, Einstein said, if you, if you can't say it simply, you don't know it well enough. Well, we pride ourselves on the fact that we know this, and so it was like, challenge accepted. We're gonna do a children's book. And so we did Mastering the Migration Monsters. Okay, we had a, we had a local uh, artist in the UK, just a brilliant gentleman who helped us with this. But basically, this tells the story of Milo and his family, and Milo has kids, and one of them's Millie, and Millie's gonna have a birthday, and, and Milo works in the data area. And by the way, the verbiage of this is all geared around children, okay? So I may embellish it with some technology stuff because of the audience, but the book is understandable by a child. I can prove it. And, and Milo goes off to work, and he has all this concerns. He's, he's, gotta, he's gotta move stuff from an old box to a shiny new box. That's what he has to do. And, and so he gets to work, and he's got this concern because his boss will be really happy with him or really mad based on what he comes up with. And I'm flipping through this fast because I don't want you to read it now. You read it later. I'll give you a link. But he asked, he asked people around him, what should I be concerned about? And they go, oh my God, all these things are going to happen. And he kept asking, well, so what causes all these problems to happen? And they said, monsters. And we said, what are the monsters? What are the monsters? Well, first is Orc the Unsighted. He keeps you from seeing things clearly. And then there's Blunderslip. Blunderslip is the the blue one that slows things down. Jumble bum, the one that can just makes people go in all different directions and you can never get the project under control. And then there's the Degradon, the, the like, you know, the, the, what do they do in the video games? It's the big boss or whatever. Degradon makes you lose stuff that you really want to keep. It's important to you. And so Milo hears about these monsters and he goes off and he says, you know, I've got to, I've got to face the day. I've got to go conquer these monsters. And so the book tells how he goes about and conquers each monster using just simple things and what he does to do that. And as he conquers the monsters, what I love about the book is the monsters don't go away, they become tamed. So as you conquer the monster, in fact, one of the things that I like about the book is it builds. As I conquer Orc the Unsighted, and I'm able to have better visibility, that's gonna help me in, in keeping things moving, which is gonna help me attack uh, Blunderslip. And then that's gonna help me keep things more organized, which is gonna help me attack you know, Jumble Bum. And then finally, I'm going to conquer the, the, the Agridon, and then Milo's all happy, okay? And by the way, this all happens in the course of the day, which I know your data projects always happen in the course of the day. But for kids, you're not going to say, and years after this, you know, <laughs> that doesn't work for a child. But in, in, in their view, Milo was trying to get home for Millie's birthday, and because he was successful, he was able to, to get to the birthday, and he got there early, and everybody's happy, okay? And then we actually, at the end, we talk about here's the monsters, and here, this, is not, this is what you don't read to your kids, but it has at the bottom a little bit about what we do at Sanity and how we can help you with those things. But that book was, was put forward, and I'll tell you, it will resonate, because last week, we put out a LinkedIn Live video in which I was talking to Jamie, the guy who actually produced this, and part of what we did in preparation of that was a couple of weeks ago, I have, a, I have seven grandkids. One of, my, one of my kids lives close to us, and she has four of them, nine, five, three, and one. My wife and I were babysitting, the one went to bed, and then we said, well, let's take the other three and sit them down, and I'm gonna read them the story, and I videotaped it. And I read them the story of migrating the, ma the monsters, right? And they listened, oddly enough, they sat there and listened. In fact, one of them was wearing monster pajamas. He was all thrilled, in fact, he had monster pajamas on. And so we read the story, and I thought, well, that was at least, it was attention getting, they at least got it. The thing that surprised me was my daughter, who's a professional educator, the next day, she asked five-year-old Lily, okay, so did you listen to Papa's book? Yes. What did you understand from the book? There's monsters. Tell me about the monsters. And she recited all four monsters. There's this one that makes you, you can't see anything. There's one that's all blue and sticky and he has pencils sticking out of him. And he slows things down. And then there's, and she described every monster, okay? I'll tell you that I've had meetings with sea level people where you explain something to them. And the next day, they couldn't tell you a thing that you said. Okay? Sometimes, may, and I'm saying C-level people are like five-year-olds, but sometimes the attention span may be like that. 
And same with other people in your projects. You need to learn how to say things in simple ways. And plus the fact that this just kind of, uh, kind of explains how monsters can be tamed and how you can actually do that within an organization. And by the way, we've got some business cards. We'll have them out at the table, but it's basically a card that has the migration monsters on it. In the back, there's a link you can go to, download it. Take as many of these cards you want. Put them on people's desks, right? It's, it's, it's a little better than migration for dummies, all right? This is more, you have kids. In fact, you might even use it with your own kids to explain what it is you do, because most people don't understand what we do anyway. But again, welcome you to use that. So that's monsters. So let's look at mountains, the other reason. And by the way, monsters are usually the case when we have to do something, it's a necessity. We don't do it or we fear doing it because there's things, there's, there's things that are going to get in our way and we're concerned about those things. The other is mountains. This is Mount Everest, okay? Question for you. What's your percentage of surviving an attempt on Everest once you get to base camp? Now base camp is, by the way, you can drive to base camp these days, okay? But from base camp up, that's the hard part. What do you think is your percentage of success of surviving that attempt today? Anyone? Percentage, come on, you guys are data people. Give me a percentage. What's that? Three, 70? 70%? 70? 90. 90? We're getting up there, okay? What's that? If it's not 100, you're not going? 99%. 99% success rate. Okay. Success being surviving. Survive. I'll tell you one thing. It's gotten to where people that to get to base camp, you're just about going to get to the top. Unless there's a weather-related interest or something like that, you'll get there. It's, it's, it, in fact, there's a place called Hillary Steps. It's a narrow, narrow steps to get to the top of the, of the summit. And it's like 80 meters long, and only one person can go up it because if it's so narrow, you can either one person go up or one person go down. At one day, like I think it was in May of 15, 2015, there was a lineup of 120 people waiting to take those steps. That's how popular the top of Everest is, okay? Let's look at this from a data transformation project. What's the success of a, of a successful data <laughs> transformation? <laughs> We're laughing. What do, you think that's, what do you think that number is? One. <laughs> We'd love to talk to you. <laughs> okay, according, according to a McKinsey study, it's 30%. And I'm actually encouraged by this because two years ago, or a year and a half ago, when I started talking about these types of stories, that number was 15. It was only 2% better than Vegas odds, all right? 30%, but 30% is a big difference from 99%. What do you, th I looked at those numbers and I said, so what's the difference? Because Everest has gotta be a formidable thing to do. And data transformation, yes, it's formidable, but why, why can't we do that? And I'll tell you the difference between the top number. These people, Sherpas, okay? There's a great National Geographic special. If you have any trouble finding it, let me know. I'd love to point it to you. But there's a gentleman who spent time with Sherpas. And one of the things he explained was that Sherpas is not a job description. Sherpa is an ethnic group. They live, in the mount they live on the mountains. Most Sherpa families have at least one member who's summited Everest. There's one guy they call Appa Sherpa. He's summited Everest 25 times. These people know the weather, they know the mountain, they, they're some of the best athletes in the world. In fact, he talks about the fact that they serve you breakfast in the morning and then save your life in the afternoon. It's like when they're serving you breakfast, he said, it's like having the top athletes, it's like having LeBron James ask you if you want sugar in your coffee. I mean, they're just humble servants, they just take care of you, right? And while they're serving you breakfast, others are out there looking at the ladders that go across the ice crevasses and making sure the ropes and stuff are in place and everything's in setup. These people can look at you and say, I know where you're gonna have a problem or I know what outfitting you need, I know what, what tools you need to make it to the top. These people will get you to the top and back down, okay? That's the difference. In fact, I don't think you can get a permit to, to actually tackle Everest unless you have Sherpas involved. Sherpas the difference, okay? I like to think when I when actually was um, first came to Sinity, I, I, I likened ourselves to data Sherpas. I think we live on the mountain. I think we, we understand data and the specifics pretty well and that we can bring people to that mountain. Now, data itself is more, of a, more than just a summit. Data is like a long time journey, but, but, but it, it clicked to me. If you have someone that can do that, the reason that they're important is because it actually, that knowledge conquers the fear, okay? How many of you have kids or can remember as being a child, you're looking, and it, the lights are out, you're, you're supposed to be asleep, and you, look, and you look in your closet and you see something. It's a monster, it's a person. You look, and the more you look at it, the more it looks like you know, a monster. And so you call dad, mom, whatever, and, you, and, the, and the parent comes in and turns on the light and shows you it's just a backpack, you know, and then they shut the door to calm you or whatever. That knowledge that you just gained 
you know, relieves the fear. Um, my dad had a different approach. When I would tell him, Dad, I'm, I'm, I can't sleep because I hear noises in the house, you know, I think there's somebody in the house, he would take me by the hand and talk, walk me through the house. And I'm like, you're taking me where all, these, where all these bad people are. Why are you doing this? But he said, let's go show you, because he wanted me to see that. He wanted me to have that knowledge. When you have knowledge, fear kind of alleviates. So if you're, if you're concerned about something, learn. Find somebody who knows something and get close to them. You need to create systems that facilitate that knowledge. And by the way, a lot of the knowledge of what you need to do is actually within your own organizations as well. You need to be able to reach out and have those open conversations with people that kind of say, from a line of business, what is it you want to do? What is the things that you're looking forward to doing? Not just, can I get my data from the new system, but what might we do in the process that will help you in the future? You need to be able to capture knowledge when and where it happens. Again, don't waste it. Don't let it fall on the floor or end up on some three ring binder on a shelf somewhere. These are the things we learned. If you ever need to learn them, go back and look at the book again. That's not where knowledge should be. Knowledge should be where people need this. Because by the way, as I mentioned, the stuff, some of the stuff we do with the, with the Synity Knowledge um, platform is you can actually, after the project's over and the person is entering the stuff into the system and they go constituent, I don't know what constituent is, they can actually click on that and see the definition of what a constituent is that was based on the project that you did, based on the person that said that, based on the document that supports that finding. And so that knowledge is captured is now, now available throughout your organization, throughout the life cycle. So capture that knowledge when and where it happens, retain and reuse it as broadly as possible. If you keep it among yourselves, if you say, this is knowledge that we learned, this is great, you're being selfish, okay? And darn you, you shouldn't do that. You should actually share the knowledge with people and then you don't need to be afraid. So for those of you who might represent this 47%, know that there's monsters out there, but you, they can be tamed, all right? It's a matter of knowing what they are. And there are people out there, including ourselves, who know what monsters are. We happen to know specific monsters really, really well. Uh, things about data migration, replication, governance, uh, uh, master data management, uh, uh, EIM systems in general. We're pretty familiar with the data monsters that are there and we can help you. And by the way, we love finding new monsters because that just makes us smarter and makes you smarter as well. So you know, let us know if we can help. And for those of you who have mountains, those of you who have people coming to you and going, you know, when you're through with the data migration project, can you help us move toward artificial intelligence? Or when, um, some, sometimes you, you may be seen as the bottleneck and you don't need to be that. You can say, look, we're doing this and it's actually gonna apply. In fact, when you use things like our, our products, you're actually getting some uh, artificial intelligence is in the product, uh, things like uh, um, natural language processing, uh, um, uh, machine learning is all part of that. You're actually exploring some of that as you go, and that'll help you kind of get things moving. And then for those of you who've got it under control, okay, I got this one, right? We're doing well, we're in good shape, which maybe a lot of you are in that situation. You, we'd still love to hear from you. In fact, uh, one of the reasons our table's out there, one of the reasons I'm here is I would love to hear what you're doing and how you're doing it. By, what, by, by no means wanting to challenge you, but you're doing things that you're learning and we'd love to learn as well with you. So we encourage you to reach out and let us know what those things are, are happening and tell us your stories. Again, if you can start off the story with, and then the cops came, I'll be more than happy to listen to you. <laughs> the other ones I like is, let me tell you something funny. Those are good stories. I love to hear those as well, but I'd love to hear those stories. I also can share stories with you. I shared one this morning about how we made a, a woman at an account cry. I'll be glad to share that with you at some time, but not this moment. Actually, I will share it because I got a few minutes. I'm looking at it a few minutes. I, I heard the story from one of our consultants uh, uh, and he told me, he said, you know, we made a woman cry once. And I'm like, that's one I want to hear because I hear a lot. And by the way, we as technologists, we tend to say things in factual things. I'm going to report to you. We did this, we made this much money, we, lost, we did this much in resources, we spent this, we did whatever, and we just fact check right. But behind that, there's people's lives are being changed and things are happening and people are able to do things. And this story was about an aerospace company that started what they thought was going to be a normal data migration project. It was one of our, eventually one of our customers, but not at that time. They just said, we're gonna do this data migration. 10 years later, they're still going, we're doing this data migration project. And, and someone at the table, when I told this this morning, they said, 10 years? How many of y'all have had data migration projects that have just gone on and on and on? Anyone? No, this must be a rare thing. But this is the point where they were just continuing to, continuing to try, continuing to try. And they kept failing and failing and failing. And I, I guess their success was, let's just push the date back. Let's push the date back. Until they finally came to us and said, can you help us? And we said, yeah, with our methods and what we can do, I think we can get a handle on this. We stepped in and it took us two years with them to do that. But at two years, they were, they were done. The data migration was over. And this project manager was sharing with our consultant 
said, uh, a woman came into my office, a woman who'd been on the project came into my office and she was crying. And he's like, what is she, what is she crying about? And he said, what's, what's wrong? And she goes, well, you know, I've been on this project since day one. I'm one of those people that knows all about the project. And I thought it would never end. I thought I was gonna spend my entire career on this data migration project. I didn't sign up to do this for the rest of my life, but that's what it seemed like. For 10 years, we did this. And she said, and in the last two years, we've made such progress and we finished this thing. And I am so relieved I can now go on and do something that I want to do. There's other things I'd like to do better than just continuing to do this thing over and over and over again. That woman's story about making a woman cry out of just, just sheer joy is the lives we change. That's what we do. That's the stories that I want you guys to begin being aware of. Start listening for those and being able to tell those. By the way, if you want your project to get funding, if you want your project to succeed, and you're saying, I'm really having a tough time explaining that, I'm available, call me or find me. I'll help listen to your story and maybe help you kind of figure out how do we tell your story to someone that, are, that matters? How do we shape what you're doing beyond just the fact that we need to move from one old box to a shiny new box? What does that story look like, okay? We, we are here to help you, so that's the offer. By the way, uh, I can say for Jeff and the rest of the ASUG team, one of, the, one of the things we talked about first was creating a space in which knowledge can happen. This is a wonderful space. If you guys leave these two days or three days uh, and you, you have questions that you haven't answered, it's probably because it's on you, okay? There's people here that have the answers. Um, in, the, in the time together where we were just introducing to one another, I met Andreas. Andreas, I met him for three minutes. This guy knows a bunch, okay? He's from SAP. Um, I think it was St Phil, uh, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, said, everyone you meet knows something you don't. Find out what other people know that you don't know and learn that, okay? And, and I'll tell you too, as I look forward and I look at some of the speakers that are, ha that are, that are here today and tomorrow and giving, uh, giving talks, I'm reminded, my son one time uh, had a test at school and he came home after the test. And it was an important test and I said, son, how'd you do? And he goes, well, dad, you know that top 10%? And I said, yes, son, I know that. He said, I'm one of those people who make that possible. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I could tell he's gonna be in sales. But the point is that, that but that's how I feel. I feel like I'm one of those people that makes it. We've got some top 10% people here uh, at the booths outside uh, giving, giving addresses. I, I want you guys to seek out those people, okay? Um, come to me with funny story, stories about cops, but go to them with your questions, all right? We've got some bright people out there, okay? And lastly, just enjoy yourself, okay? Enjoy yourself. Enjoy what you're doing, okay? I don't know. Do I need to hand this back over to anyone or we just go take a break? Thumbs up. We go take a break. Thanks, everyone.